Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We welcome you to Lakeshore Church. We are a caring, growing, and serving congregation here in St. Clair Shores, Michigan. This morning, we continue our series on resurrection hope and look specifically at the story of Peter and how Jesus restores him in John chapter 21. Uh, we'll be celebrating communion this morning, so we invite you to grab and prepare communion elements as we will partake in the Lord's Supper after the sermon. We thank you for joining us this morning. We invite you to drop in the comments where you're worshiping with us from. If you have any prayer requests, any thoughts, uh, any questions, any ways that we can serve together. Let us worship God.
good morning, everyone. Continuing on in Easter, our passage takes place this morning when Jesus is meeting with his disciples shortly after the resurrection. Passage comes from John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Hear now the words of our Lord. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you all know, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and someone else will lead you where you want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. The word of our Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have a confession to make. I failed a chemistry class in college. Ochem is the only class I've ever failed in my scholastic career, which at times was spectacular and at other times not so much. To this day, I'm ashamed that I failed that class. To this day, I carry that textbook in some box in my garage with this unrealistic hope that I'll open it up and study it and understand it one day and thus redeem myself, ridding myself of the shame. And some of you out there are probably thinking, no big whoop, bombing classes is a part of the college experience, while others of you are judging me right now, but probably not as hard as I judge or judged myself. Shame runs deep in Asian cultures in which bringing honor to your family, to your town, to your country is the greatest aspiration. And on the flip side, bringing shame is utterly to be avoided at all costs. This runs true in many aspects of life, but even more so in educational pursuits than here in Western cultures. So I come to you sharing one of my most shaming times in my life, a lowest of lows when I felt the worst I could about myself. Shame is different than guilt. Guilt is knowing or sensing or being told you've done something wrong. You've broken the law. You've hurt someone's feelings. You didn't take care of someone's belongings. You broke a promise or someone's trust. There are plenty of ways we are guilty and we feel guilty each and every day. Shame, on the other hand, is when you go from I did something bad to I am bad. From I failed a chemistry class to I am a failure. And that's where I went. That's where I was. And in many ways, it's what I fight again each and every day. During Lent, Pastor Adam led us through the series Good Enough. Yet, I don't think I'm the only one who wonders each and every day, am I good enough? and even struggles against the self-talk of, I'm not good enough. Shame is real. Shame is ever-present. But shame is not who we are. Shame does not have the last word. And that is because we have resurrection hope. In this morning's scriptures, we see the story arc of Jesus and Peter come to a conclusion. 
Do you remember what's transpired since the Last Supper on Maundy Thursday? Let's call it Peter's greatest hits. He doesn't want Jesus to wash his feet, but when Jesus says he has to, he asks Jesus to wash his whole body. When Jesus says someone will betray him, Peter sneakily finds out who? Judas. When Jesus says he's going somewhere they couldn't until a later time, Peter says, why not now? I'll die for you. To which Jesus tells him, well, actually, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. I'm sure Peter took that as a challenge. No way, Jesus, not me. Later in the evening, when Judas was bringing soldiers to arrest Jesus, Peter to the rescue. He takes out his sword and chops off a poor guy's ear, just to be told by Jesus to put away his sword. Then after Jesus is arrested and taken, Peter follows to find out what happens. And here the greatest hits start going downhill. His first denial was to a servant girl next to some officials gathered around a warming fire, and finally to a relative of the poor guy whose ear got chopped off. Three opportunities to say he followed Jesus. Three denials. A rooster crowing. Guilt. Fear. Shame. In Luke, it says he went out and wept bitterly. And we don't hear about Peter again until Easter morning. It's then that he runs to see the empty tomb when told by the women. I can't imagine all the emotions Peter must have felt in those three short or long days. But I do imagine shame was a big part of it. Peter, Petra, the rock was crumbling. In Middle Eastern culture, where honor and shame were central to their society, Peter showed no honor to Jesus. And I'm sure the despair of denying him three times, just as Jesus said he would, led him into a deep hole of shame. But resurrection happens. Hope is restored. Jesus, their teacher, their Messiah, their leader, is alive. And Peter has seen him at least twice. I'm sure he's so excited, ecstatic. But emotion alone doesn't undo shame. I'm wondering when in your lives you have felt shame. I'm doubtful it is an if, but rather a when and where. A time you felt you were the problem. You were not good enough. You were wrong, you were unworthy, you were unloved, unlovable. Maybe it's right now. Maybe you couldn't make the marriage work out the way you were sure it was supposed to. Maybe you failed miserably at a business or at your work and you feel you are the problem. Maybe you too failed a class or many classes and are stuck being the dumb one. Maybe you were or are the problem child or the secret that the family tries to hide. What's your shame story? Maybe it's admitting you need professional help with alcohol addiction, pornography, your marriage, your self-abusive behaviors. Brothers and sisters, you are not alone. You do not have to suffer through the shame by yourself. We all experience it. And even with resurrection hope, it still can be deeply seated in us. Even when we know we are a beloved child of God the Father, shame can be hard to let go of. Even when hope is restored in the world, our own worlds still need restoration. And here's the good news. Jesus restores us. 
It's after a night of fishing and a morning meal together on the beach that Jesus models his restoration for us. Peter denied Jesus three times, and Jesus gives Peter three more opportunities to claim him by asking, do you love me? And Peter steps up and answers all three times, you know I love you, yes, of course I do. But restoration isn't just Peter saying, I love you, Jesus. Each time, Jesus gives Peter instruction to live it out. Do you love me? You know I do. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? You know all things, Jesus, so you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Three denials. Three questions. Three responses proclaiming his love for Jesus. Three admonitions to care for Jesus' flock, his sheep, his church, his kingdom. I'm not sure Peter's shame was gone instantly but Jesus gives him an opportunity to work it out of him. You are not who you are at your worst moment. That does not define you. You are who I created you to be when you follow me, when you feed my sheep. I told you I still carry some of my shame of failing that chemistry class. But Jesus is doing the long work of restoration in my life. It was at this time I took seriously that God might be calling me into full-time ministry as a pastor rather than as a doctor. It was at that time I saw the depths of my pride in what I could do. And it's something I'm chipping away at each day of my life. It was soon after that that I could sit with students who had their own failures, scholastic and others, and remind them that they are not alone and that failure doesn't define them. I'm getting to work out my shame in serving and feeding Jesus' sheep. But I think we know church isn't always the safe space to work out our shame. But... It should be. Yes, boundaries should be kept. You don't need to spew off to everyone all that you're containing. But we should be vulnerable with one another and invite vulnerability with each other. We all need help and support and encouragement and challenge. Our marriages are not perfect. I know mine isn't. Our family lives aren't the Facebook perfect snapshots we want to portray. Mine is filled with yelling and anger alongside tender forgiveness and grace. Our work lives, our ministry lives are filled with stories and times we hit rock bottom. Our relationships with family, with friends, with special ones. Some are a constant struggle and battle. Whatever makes you feel shame, know that Jesus wants to restore you. That is resurrection hope. And if anyone knows a good chemistry tutor, send them my way.
Restoration for Peter began while having a meal with Jesus. It's fitting because it's at table. Peter made his bold declaration that he would never deny Jesus in the first place. But as happens many times in the gospel, it's when Jesus' followers are around table and sharing a meal that something incredible happens. And we gather around the Lord's table today, trusting that God's restoration for us, too, begins here. Remembering what Jesus has done for us and remembering that we are God's family together, we celebrate that Jesus is present with us at this table we share. And he invites us to join together with those near and far, present, past, and future, just as one day we'll be together in God's kingdom. And just as Peter was nourished physically, Jesus nourishes him spiritually and emotionally when he begins to restore him from the shame he was in and tells him to feed his sheep. Let us too be nourished spiritually and emotionally and let God bring restoration to our lives and even to the whole world through the shared meal together. Let us pray. O oh God, through the ages, you have done everything you can to bring us back to you, to bring us into your family, and to bring renewal and restoration in our lives. As we partake in this meal, take this bread and this cup, and through your Spirit, make yourself real in us, even as we're restored unto you. Take our sorrows and our shame, our sickness and our pain, and bring us the joy of your salvation and your restoration. And nourish us with this meal so we can nourish the world with your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So just as Jesus broke bread and gave it to his disciples, we too take bread and remember what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing in our lives. And as we drink this cup, we remember Jesus brings about a new covenant sealed in his blood, shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins and the sins of the world. We do this to proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, as we have taken communion together, know you are a beloved child of God. You are a beloved member of God's family. God is doing a work in you that brings healing and restoration. And you do a work in the world to bring healing and restoration to others. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us to do. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
once again we come to the time in our online gathering where we begin to draw things to a close for another week. It's always fantastic worshiping together with you online. Thank you so much for joining with us this morning. We hope that uh, you enjoyed this. We hope that you were blessed by something that you heard through the message, through the music, through whatever inspired you today. Uh, I know God spoke to my heart just in preparing this and getting all this ready. Thank you, Pastor Isaac. Great to have you back again with us, sharing from your heart. You always bring such great insights and such great inspiration to us as well. And like I said, I hope you were inspired this morning as well. You know what? Drop us a line. Let us know. Drop something in the chat. And what inspired you? What sparked something inside you this morning that, that is just hopefully made a change in your life and is going to change the week ahead of you. Thank you for those of you that are continuing to support the work of God here at Lakeshore Church, both in your volunteering and in putting your time in, as well as those who are donating financially. If you want to help us out in that aspect, there's information on the screen in front of you. You know where you can go. You can click there anytime. You can give online. You can bring something to the church to one of our gatherings or just contact the church office they will put you in touch with whoever you need to in whatever way so that you can continue to support the work of Jesus Christ going on right here through Lakeshore Church. LakeshoreChurch.com, you can find us on the net anytime, day or night. Download our app, find us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram. We're all over the place. We're all over the place, both ministering and letting you know how you can get involved in ministry and get involved in sharing the gospel of Jesus how you can go out and feed lambs and feed sheep and be a witness to those around you. That's what Jesus called Peter to do. That's what he's calling us to do as well. So there's your mission for the week. Go and find some lambs to feed. Have a great week. <laughs>